mic. I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> We're bringing out some more chairs. I'm just gonna go on and after all okay. the guys. <laughs> what are you doing next week? Hello, nice to meet you. Ashley. Ashley. Okay, I better go. Okay, I'm. I'm. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ashley McCants. Um, I am the co-chair of the fifth annual Harvard Black Arts Festival. <laughs> On behalf of myself, my co-chair Maya Payne, the entire Black Arts Festival executive board, and the Kumba Singers of Harvard College, we are so pleased to see so many of you here for this opening event, um, Invisibility to Commodity, Constructions of Black Women in Art and Media. 
Um, we do want to point out to you that this is the opening event of a series of um, festival events going on this entire weekend. Um, if you didn't pick up a program on your way in, I hope you will pick one up on your way out and take a look at all the things we have going on this weekend. Um, specifically, uh, we'd like to invite you this evening to two film screenings um, that will be happening at the Film Archive at the Carpenter Center. The first is at 7 p.m. It's entitled Murder on a Sunday Morning. And the second is at 9.15 p.m. entitled 30 Days to Life. And we are um, pleased to have Vanessa Middleton, um, the director of that film, um, joining us as well. So we hope you'll um, to see you going um, ev at everything this weekend, and we hope you enjoy this discussion. We are honored uh, today to have Dr. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham moderating this discussion for us. Um, Dr. Higginbotham is a professor of history and Afro-American studies in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. She is editor-in-chief of the Harvard Guide to Afro African American History 2001. Um, she is also the author of Righteous Discontent, The Women's Movement in the Black Baptist Church, 1880 to 1920. It's an award-winning uh, work. She is uh, currently working on the memoirs of her late husband, Judge Leon Higginbotham, Jr., uh, Chief Judge Emeritus of the U.S. Third Circuit Court of Appeals, Public Service Professor of Jurisprudence at Harvard, Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and Lecturer on Law at the Harvard Law School. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Higginbotham right now. Um, we're so pleased to have you again, and thanks again for coming. Thank you. I notice moderators stand. <laughs> well, welcome today to this event. This is the first event, in fact, of the Black Arts Festival. And we are here to explore the intriguing question um, from invisibility to commodity, question mark, constructions of black women in art and media. And when I was asked to be the moderator of this panel, I thought that I should begin by reminding the audience of how unique and provocative this question becomes when understood from a historical perspective. For over 250 years of this nation's history, the great majority of black women were quite literally commodities. They were slaves, human chattel, bought and sold for price on the market. The status of being human property brought public visibility and scrutiny. Black women were the subjects of advertisements. Here's one, Negroes for sale, a woman and her two children, one ate the other three. Said Negroes will be sold together or separately. This advertisement appeared in my husband's book, In the Matter of Color. And this advertisement constructed the black woman and her value, not as a mother, but as detachable from her children. At the very time when the dominant society placed women's value within the family relation, white women were wives and mothers to be protected and supported by husbands and fathers. The slave woman's identity was quite different. In the slave pens, the black woman is constructed and represented for sale. In the brilliant book, Soul by Soul, written by Walter Johnson on the New Orleans slave trade, Walter Johnson uses the phrase, recomposed as commodities. Black women were displayed along the walls of showrooms where they, like their men, were physically examined, touched, and questioned for purchase. Slave women were the subjects of published narratives, anti-slavery, and pro-slavery literature. And they were visible in family portraits. You see black women with um, the children of their masters in these portraits. You see them in the service of their mistresses, very much a part of the portraiture of the South. And so as we consider this topic from invisibility to commodity, let us remember that some of those images of the past continue to haunt us today. And we are very um, grateful to have 
three wonderful panelists who will talk about this subject, primarily from the 20th and the 21st century. But they will be informed by history, and some of them will, in fact, share their own personal experiences over time with you. Let me sh share our panelists with you. Callie Cros Crosley, to my left, is an experienced media personality. In fact, I'm sure most of you have seen her on television. Her work includes commentary, consulting, and speaking, as well as the, as well as the production and direction of television, film, and radio programs. She was an Academy Award nominee and the winner of an Emmy Award for the documentary feature, Bridge to Freedom which was part of Eyes on the Prize. Crosley was a producer for the ABC News program 2020, focusing on health issues, and for the primetime special, Black in White America. She is the senior producer of Black Side Productions' upcoming PBS series, This Far by Faith, stories from the African American religious experience. Callie Crosley appears as a regular panelist on the weekly television show Beat the Press. She is a media critic, and this show airs on WGBH TV. She is a graduate of Wellesley College, and she served as a Neiman Fellow here at Harvard, and currently she is a fellow of the IOP, and she leads a study group on media perspectives and biases. Our next uh, guest is Carrie Allen McRae. Carrie Allen McRae is a graduate of Talladega College and New York University. She came to writing late in life, but when she started, she has been a prolific writer. She's written essays, poetry, fiction, and a family memoir. Her poems have appeared in Ms. Magazine, The River Styx, Gloria Steinem's Moving Beyond Words, The Crimson Edge, Older Women Writing, the South Carolina Collection, the Squaw Review, and many others. In 1998, she wrote a family memoir, Freedom's Child, the life of a Confederate general's black daughter. And we're really eager to hear about that. And last but not least is an old friend, Dr. Trisha Rose. She is Associate Professor of History and African American Studies at New York University. She specializes in 20th century politics, social thought, po popular culture, and gender issues. She received her BA from Yale and her PhD in American Civilization from Brown University. She is the author of the prize-winning book, Black Noise, Rap Music and Black Culture in Contemporary America. And she is a co-editor with Andrew Ross of Microphone Fields, Youth Music and Youth Culture. She is a frequent lecturer as well as a commentator on national radio and television. Her essays on race, culture, and politics, on black popular music and gender issues have appeared in several edited collections and a wide range of journals and magazines, including Book Forum, The Village Voice, Vibe, and Boston Book Review. And she's currently, I think she's completed a book on black women's um, sexual narratives. And so today we welcome these um, panelists. I'd like to first ask them um, their reflections on this theme, this question from invisibility to commodity. Why don't we start with you, um, Carrie Ellen McRae. I think she started with me because I'm the oldest thing in this room. <laughs> and I can really talk from experience. Uh, I really, um, most of my life, and far, as far as media, this is a great topic, and I want to thank you for inviting me to, to talk about it. Um, invisibility was the thing, except the ones that you talked about as commodities in the kitchen. Uh, that's why I love Ward's Day of Absence. Uh, have all of you read Ward's Day of Absence? Mm -hmm. One person? <laughs> Get it, read it, you'll love it. All the blacks left the town. The mothers didn't know how to feed the babies. That was commodity, what you're talking about. But 
I want to, when, I, I think this is so good because this is such a different time. And um, a really different time. And I will talk more from, from my experience in my many long years uh, here. Um, I don't think that that means that we, I think we still have to be vigilant. And I will bring some of that out when we, when, when we really talk. Put up your hand when my two minutes is over. We're not supposed to talk except <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> I told her she could shut me up. I... <laughs> okay. All right. Kelly Cressley. Well, I had to ponder this theme quite a bit because I was trying to figure out what does it really mean? The question mark threw me off a little bit. Um, I am reminded of a forum that was here maybe 10 years ago. None of you would have been around. Right here in this place, and it was sponsored by the Lynx, which is a black women's organization, national black women's organization, and it was about images of black women. And I'm sorry to say that we are 10 years later and the same discussion is taking place because the same things are in evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the subtitle was from Mammies to whatever, and there was a question mark there as well. <laughs> and, and here we are. <laughs> so. Commodities from the historical standpoint meant just that, that people were bought and sold. When I th think about invisibility from a media standpoint, I think it's on two levels. First of all, there is the question of whether or not there are folk. You know, Before Julia was a show on television, were there any black women on television? That's the, the obvious invisibility. But I would have to say there's a broader one to consider, and that is whether or not black women, even if they are physically on the air, are represented correctly. So in fact, are we not, or are, are we and they all still invisible? Because what our images are, the images of us that are put out there are really, in so many times, in so many cases, way off the mark. And it never seems to address all of who we are. Um, and so that is how I would respond to the invisibility. To the commodity question, um, today on the show that I do, uh, Beat the Press, we talked about Daniel Pearl's death being now made into a commodity as people debate about whether or not they should show the tape of his murder. And in the same way, I would say, the image of a black woman and what folks think she's supposed to represent has been commoditized, com you know, productized, whatever the incorrect word I'm making up here. But you get my point. Um, it's, it's, it's being bought and sold, but in a different arena. We're not, no longer on the auction block, but maybe we're in that little square. So I'll leave it there for the moment. <laughs> well, I wanted to sort of pick up on a couple of things said here and take a slightly different take. Um, being a 20th century person, not just in living, but in what I study, I, I thought really immediately, of course, partly of the history of the physical commodification, but I also thought that the question, and it is a question, uh, really addressed the shift between a moment in which African American women were mostly invisible in the mainstream popular visual context and have moved from that marginality to a relatively central media role, particularly given the increased centrality of black imagery in the popular imagination. So partly because of hip hop, partly because of you know, WB and other TV stations which seem basically to be black youth TV stations, um, we have an abundance of representation, which we didn't have before. We have a lot more images than we used to have. So the question becomes, is this increase a commodification um, and how does it relate to the history of greater marginality? So my take on that framing is that we were more invisible in one sense, but that invisibility was a highly visible invisibility. Exactly. Don't you love academics? I like that. Okay. I like what, that. <laughs> you think you get it and then they mess you up. What, what I mean is mm -hmm. we were not visible, but everyone knew what we meant. Mm -hmm. So that our invisibility was what uh, was used to buttress what was visible. So we know what not to be when we know what black people are, mm -hmm. right? We don't see them, but we always know what they are. So the invisibility was highly known. It wasn't invisible and unknown as if to say, oh, I've never seen an African American. I don't know what they're about. Gee, they're invisible. I wonder what they're about. No, 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 no. We, there was a litany of things that we, quote, were and remain in the imagination that was reinforced by the invisibility. Now, to my mind, many of those things are also being reinforced by the commodification. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean that while we have an, much more space to 
be visible in American popular culture than any other moment in its history. Our images are extraordinarily narrow. Should you watch BET, should you have cable, should you turn on WB, should you go to the movies, except for the kinds of autonomous um, independent cinema that I'm hoping you'll see this, this weekend, you'll find a, a starkly narrow range of experiences being represented. So commodification has not only meant the reinforcement of the same logic of invisibility, but it has also narrowed the range of expression when you'd think it would open it up. So the reason why it's a question mark is because on the one hand, we are making a movement from invisibility to high visibility in the market, but at the same time, we're not moving away from invisibility because the same logic that underwrote invisibility is underwriting commodification. So there is a tension, and that's why I do think it's a really great framing of it. But that, that's my overall take on, on the conception. Mm -hmm. That's so fascinating. And, and when we think about this uh, over a period of time, uh, what fascinates me, though, is uh, when you say, uh, well, did we know who black women were? It's interesting the ways that Americans saw black women. And I'd like to turn this question to you, Carrie McRae, because Carrie McRae went to Talladega College in the 1930s. And in the 1930s, Black women's images were in many ways all over the place. Mm -hmm. They were on salt and pepper shakers. Mm -hmm. They were on... Aunt Jemima. Yes, mm -hmm. Aunt Jemima pancake, pancake mix. They were shaped like cookie jars. Um, we were the household products that people thought they knew, these servile images. And yet, Carrie, Alan McRae, you went to school during a period when, obviously, segregation was law, when there was no woman's movement. So you've seen quite a lot of changes over the decades. I'd like you to just talk to us about some of your thoughts, maybe even sharing about what led you to write your memoirs, this recent memoir. Uh, I encourage well, young and older people, to write memoirs of our people. Mm -hmm. Those combination of memoirs tell our stories. It was amazing to me, I'll get back to what you said, but this just, and I have to get back, sometime I go upstream, you tell me what you <laughs> said. Uh, it's amazing to me how little, when I go around all over the country, that whites knew about our history. It's not amazing. I'll take that back. We know everything about them because the history was about them. We were in their kitchens, as a friend of my mother's who was a maid used to say, every maid that passed around the table ain't just passing bread. So she's listening. <laughs> she's listening. Uh, and uh, that's why I encourage us to really write because there have been, there have been changes. Mm -hmm. But still there's, sometimes there's always that same Aunt Jemima image that lingers. Uh, and the other thing, we don't say, oh, there's a white woman on television. <laughs> We're still saying, oh, there's a black woman doing so and so. That shouldn't be. It should be so accepted by now that you wouldn't have to say, oh, there is a black woman. Uh, well, back in the, uh, in the 60s, uh, it was amazing because the SCLC and the NACP were fighting to get blacks on television at all. It was hard for them to accept it. The first newsman that came on who was interviewing someone, black, I mean, he was, he was black, all you saw was the hand holding the microphone. Hmm. And when we finally saw his face, the telephones were ringing all over the place. Bell, we saw his face. Did you see Bell on television? You know? And uh, I think the same thing happens with, with women. I don't know when we will get to the place when we'll just say, you know, she's on television. Not thinking of black and white, but she's on television, which is great. But we don't do that. So it means we haven't gotten there yet. Hmm. We have moved a long way, uh, but I don't think we've gotten there yet. Uh, in the 30s, at, at, in Talladega, uh, or, or anywhere, 
uh, women weren't really um, thought of as being meaningful. You know, there was a certain kind of demeaning thing about, about women. And even committees that I have sat on in the 60s, there was um, money in the government to establish undergraduate social work programs. Put up your finger. Whatever. No, you're fine. At, uh, uh, and um, so I was, they had, they said if Tuskegee and Talladega would do one together, start one together, they would give us some money, which we did. So I was appointed to the legislative committee of the, uh, and this goes to gender, uh, of the Council on Social Work Education. All men except me. And I'm trying to talk like, you know, Eleanor Cliff, she, uh, Eleanor whatever her name is, she pushes herself in. But I'm not that kind of person. So anyway, I'm trying to say something, I'm trying to say something. So finally I said, hey fellas, I'm here. And I got a response. But women shouldn't have to do that. And here I was, woman and black. Mm -hmm. So they hadn't seen me. Mm -hmm. And I'm big enough to be seen. Uh, yeah, I can see it. <laughs> you see me? See Do you all well, one could it? argue now, though, that women are all over television. Yeah. One could argue now that um, times that the pendulum has swung maybe completely to one side of the gender image um, that we see, in fact, perhaps more women on television news than we see men. What do you think about that, Callie Crossley? Um, with regard to black women's uh, presence on television news, particularly nationally, there are more women than men. And in fact, the entire business is becoming, uh, there are more women entering the business. Local television, I think, um, except Boston, <laughs> any place else you go, you see a lot of black women on the air. Um, and I think that the, <laughs> this is, let me make it clear, if it were not for Liz Walker, where would we be? <laughs> but other than, uh, other than this town, there, if you just, just traveling around, and I'm sure many of your hometowns, you see a lot of black women on the air, what appears to be a lot. And I say what appears to be a lot because I think it follows a little bit of what you've said. We're so anxious to see ourselves. We see one or two people, it looks like a lot. It actually is usually not a lot. Um, it's not too long from the time that I entered the business when I got my job because someone black left. That's generally what happens. And in most of your newsrooms, particularly your local newsrooms, if someone, and usually it's a black woman, it's very specific, and it may even be more specific than that. If a, if a brown black woman leaves, another brown black woman is hired, and, and, and vice versa, so on, so on, so on. That's just how it goes. Right. Um, there are not that many spaces. And then the, the spaces don't seem to increase by talent, per se, but they increase by, we're saving a space for you. So I'm always interested when um, affirmative action opponents, let me just throw this in, say, well, it's very easy for you all to get a job because after all, you're two things, you're black and you're a woman. And I say, how come there's only one of us here then? Please help me understand that. I need to understand why there's only one in the newsroom. And it's, in every newsroom I worked in, that was it, it was one. And that one was created when the person left. So. Um, I can say that what may appear to be a lot, we have to be a little, have a little bit more analysis about it and really pay attention to it. Now let's not even talk about, or let's talk about, the fact that those few that are on the air generally have no more power than what you see. They have the power to deliver a message to you for that day, but they're not calling the shots in the back. Um, they're not uh, determining where they will go. They're not determining the editorial focus uh, of the newscast, and that's an issue. Because how we are shaped in the end and how we come across uh, invisibility or commodity really has to do with whether or not we have some power to make those decisions. And I can tell you that very few of us do. Is there a difference, though, between black wi women and black men? Uh, is there a trend going on here? Because you get two hits with us. What's been happening in terms of the, the commodification, and I think that's better, um, <laughs> is that they, what they would do is, what they will do now is put a black woman in a position, so there are very, very few black men uh, in television news these days, particularly on air. 
And you don't have to take my word for it. Just start paying attention. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you think there's another reason? Is that, is that the, I was thinking of another possible reason, mm -hmm. which, and tell me, I, it's not my field, but it seems that it might also have something to do with the way masculinity reads as authority. I mean, I wonder, in terms of the anchor role, it seems as if women, while they have authority in some general sense, they don't carry the same kinds of authority in the way that stories are chosen and who gets to say what. And so I'm wondering if, if black men would, in fact, be more problematic, um, in addition to counting only once. I think problematic is, comes from the same images that we've dealt with over the years, which is that, are they threatening in presence? Are they, you know, right. sometimes, you know, even as a black woman, uh, I can tell you working at ABC for 13 years, if I said, well, I don't understand why we're doing that, that's interpreted as, she's so hostile. <laughs> you know, why is she so hostile? <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you how many times that has happened. I mean, and you ratchet it down as much as you can because the images that we, we haven't articulated here that we're talking right. about are black women as the big B or, or black women as loose women. Um, and, and so if you're not, not, or mammies, if you're not fitting in any one of those categories, they don't really know quite what to do with you. So, I mean, I took the point, I was so glad when email came in so I could say, hi, I'm wondering, I'm puzzled, you know, <laughs> so somebody could hear me. Uh, which is you know, you know. a kind of disembodiment. It is, so in fact, absolutely. You don't read as a black woman questioning, challenging. Now you're just an email, and they have to conjure you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, my sister historian. <laughs> that is exactly true. what it is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because, right. And, and I mean, this is real. This is going on now 2002, I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. um, and so it becomes, I think, if you have a choice, if you're going to have the big threatening black right. man, no matter if right. he's, you know, the tiniest thing with a high voice, um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> right. You know, he's threatening, right. Right. That, or yeah. me, yeah. I'm less right. threatening, so that's yeah. what's happening. But you know, that, that <laughs> really troubles me because until the white society's perception of the black male changes, we will always have. Always. Uh, I remember an article in the New York Times, I think he was a Harvard man some time ago, it was doing the Willie Horton thing, and the article was me and Willie Horton. He was a Harvard, I think, professor. Hmm. And he said if he walked down that street, that fine street where he lived, and that cop did not know that he lived down there in that big house, he would be Willie Horton. Hmm. And I really think that is one of the, the basic problems mm -hmm. of uh, Right. I mean, I guess the reason why I asked that was because I think there's a sort of a backlash against black women in that people think that, you know, we're taking up all these spots that are somehow supposed to belong to all these black men. By the way, in the academy, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there aren't there aren't that many more black women mm -hmm. than black men. Well, let me make it clear, um, there's not that many spots, period. Right. For anybody. In both places. Uh, yeah, okay. But, but, but I guess what yeah. I'm saying is that I think it is important to read how gender is working in this Absolutely. subtle way. That mm -hmm. when you question, you become very aggressive, but the reason that there might be more of you, black women, as opposed to men is because the assumption is when a man questions, he has the patriarchal privilege right. to question. That's so when right. a black man questions, he's questioning with patriarchal authority. And they can't undermine that part without undermining their own patriarchal authority. Mm -hmm. So what black women allow them to do is to do the liberal gesture. Oh, we have some blacks on board, but we don't have any men who in our patriarchal worldview actually should be equals. And so but, we actually, it seems to me, need to think about how patriarchy <laughs> is something maybe black folks should be a little less invested in because, in fact, it's not doing us any good. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, Trisha, to you then, because, I mean, <laughs> you know. I mean, I know it's not popular, all, but, you know, I mean. No, 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 and I, I do agree with you, but, but I'm, as I'm listening to you, I'm just thinking about all of these kind of vested assumptions about black women as well. There are all these images out there um, there, there are all of these black women um, in a variety of roles, but how representative are those roles, really? Yeah, this, this is what was coming to me as we were talking, because what is, it seems to me, came across when you said in that meeting, I'm here. When she says, I'm here, it's not just a physical question. It's a question about, you need to see me as I'm speaking. Mm -hmm. They had decided something about you and then stepped over you. Mm -hmm. It's not that they didn't know you were physically there. They decided something. Exactly. And that speaks to the entrenched intensity of the kinds of stereotypes you were speaking about uh, or, and how powerful or, they are. Excuse yeah. me. No, please. Whatever you had to say is not important. Not right. Not important, and especially that, unrecognizable see, if it didn't fit what they 
thought you should be talking mm -hmm. about. You know, King talks about Vietnam War. Oh, we're done listening to you. You've left the Negro question. Mm -hmm. You raise a question that leaves your little sphere in their mind of what your right. sphere ought to be, and now you're in trouble. So there's a sense in which these representations have not shifted at all. Mm -hmm. And the diversity of images have definitely expanded to some degree, but they nonetheless get funneled back. I mean, one, one thing that struck me about the whole intensity around the Anita Hill thing was how unrecognizable she was. People didn't know what to make of Anita Hill, because in the national consciousness of what categories black women can fall into, Mammy, Shrill, Jezebel, uh, uh, now the welfare queen, you know, which is a recent uh, trope, relatively recent, these images, Anita Hill didn't make sense. So there's a sense in which she broke into, she was unrecognizable, we couldn't understand why she would respond to people this way, because we know who she was. And it's not about whether or not she's exceptional or not exceptional or average. It's that people had a sense of what she should have to be. And when she didn't fit that, she, she sort of caused difficulty. But the thing I'm most concerned about right now, I don't have great expectations that the national media is going to shift its conception of black people. Believe me, this is, if I were waiting up for that, I would be very, very sleepy. Really? Because this is not going to happen. Hello. Um, yes. What, what, I'm, what I'm most concerned about is how profitable it is for black people to actually represent ourselves the way we've been representing ourselves profitable at our own hand, mm -hmm. meaning we are, in fact, supporting the reproduction of representations frequently in popular culture that claim to be keeping it real, not just hip hop, mind you, but this idea of keeping it real as a way of, of feeding into the stereotypes. So let me just take a minute with this because it, it's, it's very important. Well, to me, it's very important. So I'm going to take a minute with it. But, it, you know, it's not to say that there are not notions of, 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 of suffering in the ghetto and fabulosity in the ghetto that are, are not real. I'm not suggesting this is unreal. <laughs> what I am suggesting is that a lot of the recent er images we have fulfill two things at once. Maybe African Americans desired to be sort of fabulous and cool and hustle and, and street and to represent a certain way and at the same time fulfill a dominant cultural need, i.e. mainstream middle class whites who don't tend to know too much about everyday black life fulfills their perception of the ghetto as an exotic, excessive, loud, street-oriented, hustler, ghetto fabulous space. So it crosses two sets of needs and then, as a result, expands and takes up more and more space. We don't seem to be able to get enough of this one set of images, which is black women as highly sexual, highly available, strip clubs on every corner, according mm -hmm. to hip hop video, mm -hmm. at this particular moment in time. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of strip clubs in the black community, I, I guess. Because um, <laughs> we're keeping it real, I know. Um, <laughs> And at the same time, you know, a, a sense of sort of black street machismo and excess and hardness and distance. You know, I don't know too many black men like the men in the videos. I don't, I don't know about you, but you know, it, it's a fairly excessive portrait of everybody that we are in fact enabling the distribution of. If black folks said it was no longer cool, it would be over. It'd be a little bit of it, but it wouldn't be populating it. So the question is, how have we begun, you know, in a sense, to bring this on and continue it in our own cultural space? So much so, so much so. Uh, as a writer, I will not listen to a publisher. I'd rather for them not to publish than to say, I'll tell you what an example. I wrote a book about air shaft. I lived in Brooklyn for a long time. The idea of the book was that there was a community around this air shaft. There was uh, an Irish, elderly Irish lady. There was a Holocaust survivor, and all the rest were blacks. And through that air shaft, we could knock on the, win on the window and talk to whoever we wanted to talk with. And I have some funny stories in there, some sad stories. My, Agent sent it to six different publishers who rejected it. And I said to my publisher, I said, everybody that reads this really seems to like it. She said, you don't have enough sex. I said, oh, God, here it is again. <laughs> you know there was sex around the air shaft. <laughs> there had to be. I don't have to say that. It even. <laughs> Even the sex that I did have in there, she said, well, you're not explicit. I have a story in there about a friend of mine who lived on the first floor about keys. She would give one man a key and forget to collect it. 
and then she'd be afraid that he might walk in. I don't have to say what was going on then or why she was afraid. If she's in there drinking coffee, she wouldn't worry about whether he had a key or not. <laughs> so, but, but I'm not going to sell out. I don't care. I, I, I won't sell out. My publisher said, she, but Carrie, you could make a whole lot of money with this story, but I'm not going to do that. I think there are those that will do it right. in relation to what you said. And they will not only do it, but they will make it so explicit and more explicit. And of course, they think all of us are, well, they don't think I am, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And so I, I think you have a good point there. Well, may I ask this then? Because if, the, if I could just say something, I, don't, yeah. I think that. Uh, those people who are using media to project the images don't really have a clear understanding of how much it's like um, India ink, it stains. It doesn't go away. I think people think that they can use it mm -hmm. to promote whatever is cool, is happening, is hip, or what I think I am at the moment. And then when I change my mind about what that will be, um, then that changes as well, but it doesn't. And it has never done that with regard to black folk. Mm -hmm. It just builds on the stereotype. You mm -hmm. cannot erase it. Mm -mm. I mean, and that's what you're speaking about in terms of uh, whether or not we, we ourselves are putting forth some of this, uh, some of the kinds of images that just don't seem to go. That's why they don't go away. You know, yeah, <laughs> just, but, 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 but here's a question for, for all three of you, because th this is a contestation in our community. We've got people who are like you, Ms. McRae, who um, feel that a certain dignity should be maintained. Um, in my own writing, I talk about something called the politics of respectability. And this is an ideology in our community. It's still strong in our community in some circles, where you maintain yourself in a certain decorum, where when you make demands for justice, that you are uh, certain to not give your oppressor a reason to rationalize the negative images that he has of you, in quotes. Now, in the news, uh, there are choices to be made. What is newsworthy? You know, there are all so many stories, very positive stories that never make the news. Who makes those decisions? About six white men. <laughs> really? I'm not, I'm not being funny. Uh, I'm talking about people who are heads of major news or organizations and at major, and that's print and broadcast. Um, I am told that Karl Rove was here, who is the, um, one of the advisors to uh, J uh, President Bush, who made the statement openly that he didn't have to worry about everybody on the bus covering George Bush. He had to worry about six organizations. Period. And, and several people were saying to me they were quite shocked that he would say that. Well, you know what? He's absolutely right. <laughs> he is absolutely correct. So if you can think about that, there's about six white men making these decisions. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the bottom line. And what you have to do to claw your way up to even get some attention to say, hey, this is not correct, really takes a lot. When I was at ABC, we had started a program, actually one that was started by a, a Harvard graduate, Alelia Bundles, mm -hmm. also the author of On Her Own Ground, a story of Madam C.J. Walker. She took it upon herself using her personal capital, and by the way, that's, that's saying quite a lot at a network level, because you have to make a decision. Do I talk about these images, or do I just continue my rise up? Because you know when you start talking about it, trust me, you're not going anywhere, mm. okay? So for her, she, took, she invested her personal capital and went to the vice president news and standards for ABC and said, you know, if we're going to talk about ethics, we can't just talk about ethical issues outside of race, because how we cover folks really does speak to what the ethics are that we employ in our journalism. And when we started to look at, and we took stories from our own air and looked at how it was covered, it was very clear that some of the stuff was getting through because the people at the top didn't see it as an issue, because <laughs> there's nobody for them to talk to up there. So uh, it's sort of like a vicious circle. Now, what you're talking about, Trisha, is a different thing. You're talking about our having um, the ability to create some of this media and putting it out there when we have choices to make. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, on, on the, quote, mainstream press, people are making decisions. And uh, it, it, we're not usually in the room. This is why some, of, some of those images are, are very negative images of women. And they reinforce these um, dominant uh, images of welfare, instantly equal black women. Um, you know, these, these, these images. And, and for you, Tricia, 
because you do popular music especially, um, I want to talk about this contestation here. I mean, on the one hand, I think of a person like Dolores Tucker, who really represents you know, cleaning up the music industry. And then you have an image of someone like uh, Little Kim, who is expressive of black women's sexuality. Um, these are both black women, and I, I will concede there is a generational difference, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but these are both black women. I mean, you um, know, what is the that? Problem, yeah, see, this, this is where, you know, two or three different things are going on at once. Exactly. <laughs> One, you know, the politics of respectability to me is a deeply class stratified problem. Um, and I think we should talk about class and, and the question of how res whether or not respectability is actually going to get us out of the trap. I mean, if we all acted perfectly in whatever that would mean, would, we, would, would racism and gender oppression end? And my answer is no. No. <laughs> Are there things that need to be said that might not sound respectable? Yes. Uh, a lot of rage needs to be articulated. A lot of suffering needs to be articulated. A lot of gut bucket activity needs to be articulated in certain places at certain times. So I am actually anxious about the tension between excessive um, stereotypical portrayal, mm -hmm. which we, you know, in a sense was in your question, quote Little Kim, which yes. I'm just following your question, I'm yes. not putting her there myself, and then Doris, see Dolores <laughs> Tucker on the other end, you see, mm -hmm. and those are polarizations that actually fit the kinds of, of silences that I think we're still facing. In other words, black women are quite in the middle. Very few of us are Little Kim and very few of us are C. Dolores Tucker. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think what's really important is that we wind up in this polarized conversation and the enormous complexity and uh, much, much more um, entangled lives that we live, how complicated it is to come of age as a black woman and to take on the kinds of responsibilities that black women take on, and whether or not we struggle with the concerns about how blackness and masculinity become a place that helps sometimes silence our specific experiences because we feel we're betraying some larger community by pointing out, you know, many women in many generations continue to struggle with this. And so we, we work between a kind of excessive stereotype and a total total kind of silencing. Neither of these to me are appropriate. I mean, and that's why I don't turn to the mass media. In other words, I actually think that why I love the question of this panel is that it raises the question, well, okay, well, do we have to participate? in this. Don't we want to actually, on the one hand, challenge what's going on in the media and say, look, there's not enough space for us to articulate ourselves. We're much more rich, much more complicated than this. Mm -hmm. And we're not, you know, we're not either welfare queens or respectable, exactly. you know, good women that you would like. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not any of these yeah. things. We're a lot of other things. And the moment you start seeing us as individuals and as part of a collective group, it will be, you will be unable. These stereotypes will make no sense. The only way to undermine these, these tropes is to create so much diversity and complexity in representation that you can no longer draw the trope as an example. So when you say a white woman, you mean a million different things. Mm -hmm. No one means one thing. And that's what I think we really have to focus you, on is it, working it, beyond these spaces. How do you achieve that without? media though. I, well, I, I'm, you know. well, I mean, I think part of it has to do with how we approach the media. I am a little cynical about what I think mass media can do because I'm convinced well, that even, yeah, <laughs> even, if has... we, even if we put a black woman or two black women in that top six, in order for them to get there and stay there, they can't represent the politics you're talking about. So the representation, having a couple filled in isn't going to change it. We have to transform what meanings people are looking for. And that has to happen mm -hmm. at a cultural and everyday level. And I think it has to do with expanding the public sphere. In other words, we have to see our own representations and lived experiences and stories like the ones you're talking about in a wide arrangement of places and not look to mass media for ourselves. In other words, we can go there and check stuff out, but don't look to find ourselves there. And we need to look in much more local places where everyday people that we know are represented and are expressing themselves and to, to stay face to face because this level of mediation makes it easier to categorize and just see a trope and follow it. And I think it's but much more than several bodies. But, but, but who has the authoritative responsibility here? I mean, is this a black woman's issue? Are we the voices of ourselves? Because so many other people write about us. Black men write about us. White men write about us. White women write about us. How do we have a conversation with all of these people writing about us, about who we really are? Mm. Well, I mean, I, I, please, go ahead. No, I, what I was going to say, I think we have across the board all of the good, the bad, the evil, the good, you know, whatever, just as in any other group. 
But the thing is, it's the concentration on these bad things. And when you speak of respectability, there, there can be respectability across the board. I don't, I don't think it's always a class thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I work with a lot of youngsters from homes that are pretty uh, awful. But you'll find a grandmother there that is a very respectable person, very respectable. A lot of drugs coming in the house, not the grandmother's fault. So I, I, don't, right. I don't think that's always a class thing. There's a lot of respectability in the right. uh, lower economic uh, right. black group. Yeah, I didn't mean to suggest that. I meant to say the politics no, of No, I was just, I, I knew yeah, you yeah. didn't, but yeah. I just wanted everybody <laughs> else to understand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the translation. <laughs> but again, yeah. if you could now, just. How are we going to speak? Yes, how are we going to speak? And uh, are there spaces to have a dialogue that can transform the representation of black women to bring in all of this, all of this complexity that we would like to see? How do we achieve that? At the risk of sounding like an old civil rights person, you have to work within and without the system. And so there's going to have to be folks in the system, no matter how we may feel about mass media and its, and its intent and its purposes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that if I'm there, then that means that there's another black family that gets in a story that looks like a regular black family. They're just doing their thing, and they're in a story. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's 19 million folk that see a regular black family on 2020 doing their thing. And it has to have some impact That's somewhere. Right. Yeah. And in fact, some of my colleagues would say to me, one of them said to me after I'd been there two years, he said, uh, let me, you know, I I noticed something different about your stories. I said, oh, what would that be? He said, you got black people in them. I mean, he was w w really forthright. He, you know, he, he was, and you would think that that's, I mean, that's outrageous at this point in time, but it's not. So you need to have that, but you also need to have, and I'm sorry she's not here with us, the work that Julie Dash is doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but you have to have folks supporting that. She just did, if, if you guys aren't aware, she just finished directing the Rosa Parks story that was on CBS. And um, it was a historically accurate piece, except I was telling one of the students that some of the archival footage was incorrect, but the stuff she did was good. <laughs> um, and I mean, those are the kinds of images that you want to have out there. What was the real story about a Rosa Parks? And what are the real stories that are going to be articulated in some of these independent films? So it's, it's going to take a combination of both. But you're right. Also, if we're not telling our own stories, then I, you know. See, the, <laughs> so the, I mean, the thing I have, I, I'm concerned with, I think we need to lobby also those mainstream industries. Oh, absolutely. Um, in addition yeah. to hoping that we get more people involved on the inside, I think we need to demand that certain kinds of portraits be told. We need to see it as a form of activism, not as a form of consumption. So we need to see the media as a place that we act, because it is, I mean, I think this is where a generation gap, I think, is important. If you talk to people, you know, and I can't wait to, to talk with the audience, but my sense is that, you know, people who were adolescent after cable mm -hmm. have a very different media experience. They do. Because we're talking about 100, 200 stations with lots of so-called diversity, but mm -hmm. no diversity. Right. And that there's, in a sense, a reinforcement, and the cultural space has been taken up by visualization. In other words, there's much more media in our cultural lives than there was 25 years ago, mm. way more. And what that means is that we're looking to that space as a cultural space, as a space to find what's going on, rather than locally making what is going on. And then eventually it sneaks in and five minutes it's on, you know, Ed McMahon or, you know, Tonight Show or something. Instead, it starts there and we find out and then we follow it. And that's a generation gap oh, that I think I, means, you know, we should figure yes. out what, what do we do for that mm. political environment, mm. which I think means a different kind of strategy because including more African Americans, I don't think is going to change that particular problem. Although I do think it's important that we get more and we fight for more. But I think this other problem has to do with what we perceive the media to be. Let me, let me pick up on your point about pa passivity and just having media come in at you and, and being accepting it that way and tell you the story of a group of uh, African Americans from Detroit who saw a piece on, on 2020, they did not like. They did not like the way Detroit was represented in their community. And guess what they did? They used the old civil rights tactic. They got on a plane and flew to New York and picketed from Detroit. <laughs> said, we do not appreciate this. And guess what? They ended up meeting with the vice president mm. of, of uh, ABC, and some stuff changed. So that's an old way of doing it. That's but right. that requires not being passive and understanding that you do, you can control, even if it's nothing but clicking like this, which, by the way, means stuff to folk. Because because that's money. If you're clicking away, that's money. Mm -hmm. You know, they can hear you when yeah. you start doing that. That's right. So. Mm -hmm. Why don't we open this up to you now? 
We'd love for you to ask questions. Please come to the microphones. I think there may be microphones up <laughs> in the um, upper levels too. And direct your questions to a particular person if you uh, care to do that. Please identify yourself um, uh, at the okay. same time. Yes. Can I direct it to the whole panel? Uh, y yes, and please be brief though in okay. your answers. I, my name is Matthew Bugo Fields. I'm a d dual degree student at the business school and at the education school, <laughs> master's student. Um, I, I just came from the barber shop, if y'all couldn't tell. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> David Michael Central Square. Hooked, they hooked the brother up. Um, and, and, and actually, my question is about that very thing. I view the barbershop in the black community as being, in many ways, the center of black maleness. And, and, and being so detached, that conversation, that dialogue takes place there from this eloquent panel. And what I want, and what I want to know is, you're all very articulate, and, and I appreciate that, but how do we get this dialogue in the barbershop? How do we get these issues discussed at the barbershop? How do we introduce that um, in the barbershop form of the barbershop? That's my question. Unisex question. hair. Okay. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. I know. <laughs> that's what, that's what Black women would be the first to oppose. <laughs> okay, go on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like wanna, to answer? You wanna start? No, you, you go ahead first. Um, well, I do kind of have that conversation in, in my barbershop, because I actually go to a barbershop and deal with my hair. Um, and my barbers are Muslim, so maybe that's why we're having these discussions. Uh, so I think it's just a, it's, it's incumbent upon her, on us to raise them. You know, if you're in the barbershop and, the, and they're showing the images that, that we're talking about, you really have to say something about it and really speak about why that is that it's bothering you. But you can't um, begin a dialogue unless you s speak up. I guess is the only thing I can say. Mm -hmm. And um, there's other ways too. They're all, I think it is incumbent upon us not, I mean, you don't have to stop and write a book as Carrie did though, that's good. But I think that it's important for us to our voices to be heard on radio, on you know, whatever, create your own thing. The more that's out there, there's more of a menu for everybody to see that, that we are not a monolithic community. Okay. Why can't you bring it up? Why can't you? Well, my question is more about, and I'm using the barbershop as a metaphor yeah, for spaces where black, like I went to Morehouse College and we had these eloquent discussions at Spelman about, you know, black womanhood and sexism and all these things, but very little of that made it through the walls to Morehouse. And I think that's extremely problematic. So my question is, how do we introduce it in a palatable way so you can even start the dialogue? Because you're not going to start it with, um, you know, well, I believe these imageries, <laughs> no, no. that ain't going to happen. No, but you're going to start it, hey, man, so and so and so. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, OK, we'll start it that way. Oh, I, I, I've done started it. You've already? Oh, yeah, okay. but, but yeah you're, you're saying, though, it's hard to keep it going and to make it part of the space. Yes. Um, I think one of the ways to do it, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that, you know, the problem of, of sort of gender oppression isn't just about talking about black women, but dismantling patriarchy. Remember, that's where I started a, a little while ago, because it's not mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. people don't necessarily know what black women's experiences are, per se, in the black community, or that black men don't notice black women working so hard, or don't notice black mothers and grandmothers, mm -hmm. the ones you mentioned earlier. It's a, it's a framework we put them in, as in these are the sacrificial, amazing, parents and mothers and grandparents, and these are these other women I deal with. You know, these sort of, we separate them out in a patriarchal way. Now, the way to get around that, it seems to me, is to talk about how masculinity has been attached to patriarchy. Because masculinity doesn't have to equal patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So the conversation isn't always about women, per se, to get this conversation going, but to saying, well, what, what becomes important to men in those conversations? What, what are bragging rights about? I mean, we need to talk about socially what value we get from reinforcing certain kinds of ideas and images and, you know, highly hypersexualizations or devaluing women as a way of bonding, for example. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean learning about women only. It means re-evaluating what masculinity is about. I mean, I see it as a really a two-part conversation. Um, I don't know if that helps you, but that just... Thank you. Thanks a lot for the question. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Kelly Johnson. I'm a senior at the college. And I guess I'll direct my question to Ms. McCray because I heard you bring it up. But I had a question about the stereotypes you guys um, brought up, in particular the Aunt Jemima, Mammy stereotype. Mm -hmm. And I had a discussion about this with my mother. And I was wondering, because there's this kind of duality in it, 
behind her smile, there's this strength and there's this dignity. Mm -hmm. And so there's a reason to take pride in her. At the same time, a lot of people are shamed by her. And I was wondering what, I was curious about what your opinions were about that duality. Well, you're right, there is strength and all. But the thing is, there was a time when only that was shown. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Uh, and it was Aunt Jemima, it was the coon music, it was the coon this and the coon jack. So there is a, a respectability about Aunt Jemima because she is a strong person. But there's also, in some, it, it depends on who's looking at the Aunt Jemima and who created the Aunt Jemima, you see. Now, Aunt Jemima to me is fine because she made those good pancakes so bad, you know. <laughs> but what it means to, to some uh, whites, I'm sure, is what I guess you were talking about in the beginning. This is my commodity. That's the commodity person. So how you react to it might be quite different. I, I'm glad you said the strength because that strength has been there, you know, through the years. Uh, but, but how you use that image is a different thing. You know, I refer you to Donald Bogle's book, not the most recent one, which is Primetime Blues, but Tom's, Coons, Mammies, and Books, um, mm -hmm. which is a really interesting book. And he talks about the women, the actresses, who were forced to play those roles, and really what they did to maintain their dignity while playing. It was pretty amazing. Um, some, so as a survival technique, they figured, out, figured their way around it. And I think in the same way, uh, the image is a complex one, as you've said. And if we try to look really behind what the image is, maybe we'll come to a little peace with it. That's the hard thing. Is there a question upstairs? Yes. Over here? I'm sorry. I can't see you for the light. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to direct my question to Dr. Rose. Um, when you're talking about the sort of narrow band of images of black women and black men in the media, I guess the first thought that I had was, well, images sort of by their nature in the media are reductionist. I mean, I don't think of all these various roles of complexity for white women or Asian women or white men for that matter in the media. That to a certain extent, when you throw something up there and divorce it from its actual humanity, you create a sort of you know, paper cutout or two at best dimensional image of people. And so if you were, and then you talk about this sort of post-cable mindset, that uh, the visual space be sort of laying the, the psychological patterning in some way for us to take in what we see every day, to you know, draw images of real people into this patriarchal box or whatever images we see out there. But without completely disavowing the sort of normal life that many of us are subject to, which includes, unfortunately, from too many people, a lot of TV, or includes not even television, but just literally walking around your space, like to have a day without looking at magazine covers or advertisements. <clears throat> but if you are an average working class person who cannot construct your life in, at Harvard or somewhere like that where you can completely disavow that space, mm -hmm. how do you resist that patterning that happens? I right. mean, what are your mm -hmm. prescriptions? Right, that's a great, very complicated mm -hmm. set of mm -hmm. questions. Uh, I can't see you without holding my hand up, so I'm gonna look around, but I'm talking to you, okay, <laughs> as well as everyone else, but it's really a bright light above your head. Um, first of all, um, I'm not really trying to suggest that, you know, we're all just blindly consuming it any more than any other generation was consuming blindly what was going on. We have critical moments in a variety of ways. What I'm really trying to point out is that many of us think that black popular culture by definition contradicts what goes on in the mainstream imagination. That we see it as an automatically resistant and radical space. And I want to challenge that a little bit and say that we should have a content-based politics. Right? Because otherwise we wind up with the notion of simply more representation as if more black faces will change something or it doesn't matter what they think as long as they're black. And I'm really trying to point out that we should ask ourselves more about that. Now to get to your primary question, which is about how do everyday people respond to this, and I think you know, there's a lot more dissent and complexity and frustration across the board, but I think that part of it is that you know, there's a kind of internal censorship that we don't want to challenge black people who are doing this. Because quite frankly, the, you know, the news notwithstanding, if you look at the popular arena, most of these representations are produced by black people. 
And that's something we have to grapple with. And I'm not saying they're bad representations. I actually like a lot of them. I watch a lot of MTV. I watch a lot of other videos. I mean, it's not like I, I don't sit around at Harvard avoiding magazines, actually. But, uh, you know, I watch a ton of television to my husband's great, great chagrin. But, you know, it's not about that. It's about how we're choosing to watch it. And that has to do with public space. That's what I meant about public space. If we have and we use churches, we use schools, we use places to have not Harvard conversations, but just everyday conversations. I would bet you everything we say up here has been said in the barbershop, has been said somewhere else, mm -hmm. but we don't hear each other saying it because we, all, we primarily go into our homes with our kids after a 50, 60 hour work week, exhausted, and take a break to watch TV, rightfully so. So but the question becomes, can we create public spaces that produce some sense of relaxation and human connection that give us the time to reflect collectively about things that we may, in fact, be thinking on our own, which I think is already going on. So that, to me, means treating this as something we should be in dialogue about. And the place I think we should be the most critical and active, those of us who have the luxury of the time and, 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 and privilege, is to spend the time criticizing the narrowing of black space among black media. In other words, black radio and black television needs to be pressed, like maybe we need to fly from Detroit or fly from someplace else and say, look, we want more open space. We want more call-in time. We want to hear from everybody else. We want different shows. We want more things. And if those radio stations and television stations have to answer to us primarily, more so than anybody else. And when we hear each other, perhaps in a public sense, it'll help us out. So I mean, that, that's the kind of activity I'm hoping mm -hmm. will, will help. If I could just add a couple of things. I think this is not, um, it, I think it's internal powerlessness um, and people see media as capital M. It's actually small m. One phone call um, to a network to say, I am unhappy with what I saw, represents 10,000 households. Hmm. And, and, a, and a letter is more than that. Hmm. But to get folks to write or call hmm. is like pulling teeth. So there is an internal powerlessness about feeling like, well, I'm here, I'm watching it after my 50 or 60, and what can I do about it anyway? I'll just look at it. Right. So there's, there's, mm -hmm. that, that really needs to be. Right. And then, Maybe we can get churches to put these media num phone numbers on speed dial, get the congregations. <laughs> get out but, uh, but I know. also think <laughs> the other point that you made about people being born after cable has come into being means that there has been a certain amount of passivity and not critical analysis. That's something that we're talking about in my, in my uh, sessions, just how to deconstruct the message. People, you look at it and you accept it for what it is, but actually, what are the reasons why it's there? Right. Whose Even agenda literacy. put it there? Mm -hmm. right. What's going, I mean, that's the way you should be approaching all of this. That's right. mm -hmm. And you know, we don't really teach that. I mean, here we have a world where most of our politics, most of our you know, representation happens through the mass media. I mean, we learn about the election issues through mass media, not through that moment of voting, and yet we have no curriculum on media literacy. How are images constructed? What's going on? Where does it come? The whole country suffers from right. an enormous inability to see it as a reading. How do we learn to read representation? And I think we should demand that everyday curriculum and television itself be forced to articulate that. And again, uh, you know, I think speed dial. We yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we have questions up here, too. Yes. Uh, my name is Jason Glenn. I'm a fifth year student in the History of Science Department. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Higginbotham, you started off the conversation by saying that we were going to historicize this conversation. And uh, I'd, I'd like to try to ask a question along those lines. Uh, the panel started off with a discussion about invisibility. And I was immediately taken to Ralph Ellison's discussion of invisibility. And when he talked about being invisible, about it not being necessarily an issue with any peculiarity to his epidermis, but rather a matter of the construction of the inner eyes, those eyes with which we look through our physical eyes upon reality. And so this whole idea about that there is a such thing as an inner eyes, um, things that are constructed to see reality in a certain way, such that when we view images of blacks on TV, usually they can either do one of two things. They can either confirm the rule or they can be an exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, the rule is still there in place. Um, and I think the construction of the inner eyes doesn't necessarily just take place with white Americans. Um, black people are educated to have the same inner eyes and look upon other black people in the same way that everyone else in America is. So, uh, Professor Rose, when you talk about blacks' participation in uh, the c conserving these images and our participation in helping put them out, 
is very logical sort of within that sense. And so I wanted to know if we could get a conversation about how do you address the construction of those inner eyes, that process with which we, along with everybody else, learn that there is a certain conception of what it means to be black and how we all equally deal uh, with the problem trying to break out of those kind of conceptions. Mm -hmm. That's an important question. I think yeah. though, I'm just going to ask one of you to try to take it, only because I do want to get to some yeah. of the others, because um, we have quite a large number of you people standing it. here. So could yeah. just one person, rather than us, have everyone talk about it? Would you like no, to talk no. about it? Um, well, you know, I do think on the one hand it is logical that African Americans would internalize some of this, but I don't think it's as immediate and logical as people might think. In other words, one of the things that has always impeded us from seeing ourselves as dominant culture has seen us are black institutions and the history of being around ourselves and knowing that we do not reflect what we see. We see the range of black people living lives in everyday uh, experiences, and those things undermine the sort of tropes that are in the dominant sphere. So I do think that we have internalized it, but I think we've increased that internalization because of the expansion of mass media and the fact that media representations have not transformed themselves. And so it is, a, I think, a shift that has taken some place. But again, you know, I think race is one trope here, but gender is another. You see, black women are in a very distinctive place in this conversation, and that is that it's very hard to see the specificity of black women. We, we immediately go to the general of race, and the point is that when black women voice their specificity, they have to make a gendered critique, almost without exception, and when they do that, they have to critique internally. And that, in black historical terms, is close to blasphemy. You have to say, we have a patriarchal problem in our community. We have a gender domination mm -hmm. problem that articulates itself differently mm -hmm. than it does elsewhere, because we have different kinds of unemployment issues, we have different kinds of hostility mm -hmm. toward black men that we don't have toward white men, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a difference. But there is nonetheless an extraordinary kind of burden on black women that produces a kind of silence that is a little bit different. The invisibility of black women is not the same as Ralph Ellison in, a, in an important way. It is both the same and not. So I guess what I'm saying here is that we, we do want to um, recognize that we've internalized some of this, but to say that we need to do some more critical reflection beyond the media, to spend more time in public sphere. We had black institutions for most of our history that enable the kinds of conversations that your story talks about, you know, where people are in conversation, not looking outward. So I guess what I want to call semi-private public spaces. I want us to think about developing local semi-private public spaces where we're really face to face and there's no cameras and we're really just having over and over and over again to reinforce the senses of ourselves that will help undermine some of what I think you're right about pointing out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Sal, Misha. Okay, my name's Sal, Misha Tillard. I'm a third year in AMSIV. And my question is, I guess, different than Jason's in terms of the historical specificity. It's more about Oprah. And I was wondering if whoever wants to answer, but in terms of media, I do think of Oprah, and I do think in some ways she seems like the antithesis of commodification because she's capital and wealth, or she seems like she's very visible, not invisible. And so I was just, and she brings up a lot of sort of interesting conversations in the circles that I'm in. So I was wondering how does Oprah fit into this conversation as both an individual and then Oprah as a figure, or Oprah sort of occupying the American imagination. And, and that, that's part of my question. I wanted to ask that question, too. Um, and so, I mean, the other thing about Oprah is that she's a producer of images. I mean, she not only is a, is a representation of black womanhood, but she controls the production of images, and she influences a lot of what happens in terms of, you know, black yeah. images getting out there. So. Um, you're <laughs> I like that. I like yeah. you already having that, that thing I was yeah. hoping for. Good coordination. Mm -hmm. um, you're both right, and I think that, there, that folks need to take a critical look at that which she does produce. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Um, and, and not assume, as, as Professor Rose has so articulated, that because she is black that everything that she produces is, is what you want her to, what you would like to have out there. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that she herself has articulated on the show, and more than one occasion, 
how it is that white people generally come to see her as the other or different. Mm. And she has articulated on her show, hello, I'm black too. And usually the response to the person who is startled by that says, well, uh, well, I, but I don't, I don't see you as black. Mm. And, and, and people think that that's a compliment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and she has had to articulate, even in her most universal way, hello, I am black too. Um, and I think that's what you're responding to, that she has become an icon, but she is also, th the image of her is such a commodity at this point that in terms of mainstream folk, and I think a lot of black people don't view her as, well, however you want to define it, whatever the inner eye says, they don't define her as black. And I think that that's, um, that's something that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean to say that I don't think that she, you know, uh, hasn't done a lot of good things, that she, and in fact, I think she has uh, co-opted media in the best way possible to do what she wanted to do. And I commend her for that. Now, um, you know, she doesn't need the money, so she can do whatever she wants to. But I do think that, based, again, back to you, sometimes we don't want to be critical about folks that we think that have advanced the cause to some degree. Um, it's what Chris Rock calls that, calls that test. Did you ever see him do this test? The, the, the black people go forward test. You know, if you're little Kim, it takes us back 50 points. If you're, <laughs> if you're Oprah, you go, you go up say, 40 points. Yeah. So, you know, she's on the, been on the up 40 point side. But I mean, there's some things that need to be challenged. And uh, folks are reluctant to do that. That's good. So you're both right. But you know, I, will, I, I really wonder about the person that says, I don't see you as black. What Absolutely. Are they thinking, yeah. You know, what are they thinking about black? I think of you as one of us. You have whitenized yourself. Exactly. And, and that's, that's not good. Uh, so, well, there are some black folks that would say the fact that anybody could say that to her raises a question. Yeah. And then there were other people that say that, you know, at least she is saying, hello, I am black. Which, and it, it's happened more than once on her show. Yeah. Um, so. Hmm. Yes. Hi, my name is Kim McClure. I'm a master's student here at the Kennedy School. I have a question about a, another prominent uh, black female figure. I wanted to get your thoughts on the recent media uh, representations of our national security advisor, Dr. Condoleezza Rice. Mm. You know, we, here we have a, a sister who is being uh, portrayed in a way that the world has never seen a black woman before. She is being heralded as the most powerful woman in the world, whether or not you want to put that word black in there. And, and yet, in the media portrayals that I see of her, they always refer to her blackness in terms of her upbringing in the segregated South in the 1960s and how she was a good friend of one of the four little girls that was killed in the church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama. And I recently saw a television special that People Magazine did on her where they spent five to ten minutes just talking about her femininity, talking about how she likes to get her hair done and wear makeup mm. and go shopping. And while that's true of her, I couldn't help but wonder, you know, why is this necessary? We didn't see this for any of the former national security advisors <laughs> talking about how masculine they were. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just, I don't know, because to an extent you can interpret that as, um, well, you know, they're trying not just to portray her as an aggressive, strong, powerful black woman, but they're trying to show that she's still a woman in so many lights, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. That's what they're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer to it. I mean, they don't know, I mean, she's a different animal. I mean, it really is important for people to realize that, you know, when you operate in these, out here in the world, when you, well, get out past these walls, um, if people view black folks in general as sort of different kinds of personalities. You're almost an alien species. So in a work environment, when we talk about images of black women being so fixed as either the B word, the aggressive word, or loose women, or whatever we are, mammies, and if you don't fit any of those, as uh, Professor Rose was talking about, Anita Hill, you know, you're, you're sort of just standing out there as the other, sort of what you know, Oprah is dealing with on, on one level. Mm -hmm. So people in the mass media, so they try to categorize you. They're trying to find a way, well, how do we, are, how do we describe her? Oh, well, okay, we'll talk about how she's feminine. And it absolutely is sexist. Oh, we'll talk about how she's black. Well, that's a little racist, too, because the woman is the most powerful person in, 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 um, in the free world at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not being attended to. So the only thing you can do about it is pick up that phone or write or call or make your own story about her in which that is really not a part of it. But that, that may be the way she wants to be portrayed. I don't know. I would doubt that very seriously. She's a pretty serious 
babe. Yeah, but I don't, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but I also think there is a sense in which um, she probably. I mean, I, I would doubt that all these profiles would happen without her consent. She's definitely in control of what happens. Oh, yeah. Oprah did yeah. a profile with her, and it was enormously shallow. I wanted to know all kind of things. Mm -hmm. How did you grow up in the segregated South and wind Not up working for two members of the Bush family <laughs> without any problems? <laughs> that they can try to dismantle everything that would help any black person in this country. Housing, welfare, food stamps, child support. But, you know, all of a sudden they can put, he can have more black people in his cabinet than, than, than Clinton. Aside from what, the what political... politically does that enable? No, but I think, but I think because she's a conservative, it's not just her being in the South; it's her political orientation. If she were on the left, she would have a different political problem of recognition. You see, now she doesn't look shrill because she's coming from a conservative perspective. She has to look warm and connected to black people. So we hear all about the South, and we hear all about how they're connected to civil rights. See, to me, this is a deep media. I mean, again, I got my own conspiracy problems, but you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not. I mean, when when we have West. Wing, and then we have the Bush, you know, then we and go the see the real part. West Wing. There's a real tie in that's making okay, me yeah. anxious. Patricia, look, oh, People start, Magazine, let's, let's Oprah, start, and you know, let's all of start <laughs> with media literacy. Yeah. If you're doing what people I'm to do and right Oprah, here. <laughs> no, if you're doing people and Oprah, what do you think it's going to be? We're not talking about anything deep there. It, that's people and Oprah. That's what they deal with. You know, Mandela now. Mandela was much deeper. I all right. Think Mandela's was much deeper. Oh, I mean, oh, I read oh, Oprah. All right, ladies. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I need to start writing letters, though, like you said. I need to start doing that. Yeah, um, I'm not exactly sure I'm going to pose this um, question, but I guess I, this is... Adam, you should introduce yourself, My name please. is Adam Biggs. I'm a graduate student in uh, the American Studies program. Um, and one of my questions is, I mean, this is sort of, I don't know, sort of a frustrating dialogue for me in some ways, because mm -hmm. I feel as though it's almost goes without arguing that American democracy has been founded on racial, gender, and class um, ex exploitation. And there, you could probably say that modern progress is in a lot of ways founded on those very um, same goals. And the idea that this is somehow something that we've just been doing wrong up to this point, that is to say, not that we have not doing anything wrong, but something that we're just going to, a history which we're going to divorce ourselves from, and create this utopian sort of place where these won't, patriarchy won't be a problem, racial difference won't be a problem, um, class differences won't be a problem, and that somehow we're free from that. Like we have a vision that these people who came behind us didn't for the last millenniums. Um, it seems to me just, I mean, what's the benefit of that? I mean, what is- so Is your question, Adam, that uh, this is naive, that our efforts to talk about a new media literacy, our efforts to talk about uh, changing the way we understand and talk to one another about patriarchy, that that is naive given the history of what has come before. Is that your question? Not, that's well, not my, ask the question. That, that's my question. Just ask the I question mean, of one of these members. Ask you, you, want me to, you want me to move a little faster, is that what you're saying? Okay, <laughs> right. What I'm more concerned about is what are the greater tensions that are at play here? That is to say, we're on both sides of this coin in some very important ways, it sees, that we actually recreate <clears throat> some of the disparities that we um, are very much trying to critique right now and saying that we're trying to escape ourselves from. How do we go about, I mean, where's the humility in that? I mean, where do you go about, yeah, get sort of presenting ourselves as the sort of enlightened ones in that regard. I mean, I'm not sure. Well, well, I guess what I'm hearing you ask is that um, you, you're concerned about us imagining ourselves getting out of a, a box that we're, in a sense, claiming that other people either didn't know or weren't getting out of. You want us to connect ourselves to that history more in the way we think about this? Yeah. OK. Um, Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, you know, I think that what we're trying to do is say that we have been struggling enormously. Um, m most of the racialized and gendered struggles and class-based struggles that African Americans have been involved in have been very successful in many circumstances, but there's been an awful lot of resistance to them, even as we've made some progress. You know, the little bit that happened in the civil rights has been, attempts have been made to roll it back mm -hmm. every year, and more and more. Same thing with issues of feminism for all women, especially for poor women of all colors. And so what we're trying to do is figure out, okay, this can't just be a legal shift, it has to be an ideological shift. 
one that actually speaks to most people so that when the laws get changed, they don't get unchanged in 15 minutes. And I think what we're trying to address is what happens after many people have struggled so much, and yet we, we speak so much about the possibility of democracy and equality. Of course, we have a, an awful history in many, many ways. That doesn't separate us from most of the globe, tragically. And so we have to figure out how can we, given all that we do know, given all that we claim we've learned, really make that change. And I think we're trying to respond to the newer medias that we, that we have to face now. But is that a utopian vision, that that change will actually No, it's a place? process. I mean, for me, it's not utopian. Yeah. It's an ongoing struggle. I assume, tragically, that all of us will pass away before all of this totally changes. But in the act of struggling, a lot is learned, people's lives are changed, and the possibility of future struggle lies in us watching ourselves struggle now. Young people see us struggle, they will struggle too. They see us giving up, we know what the future holds. And, and, so and the, on the, the other side, um, what you said, new media, I think we, we really do have to be um, thoughtful about this because we live in a different age now. We live in an age of the internet, satellite, uh, cable television. Uh, these images are coming in so many different ways, newer ways. How do we have a voice to address all of those different ways? That is for the 21st century. That's not a, just an issue that we can look back to the past and answer. find an answer. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. My question, oh, my name is Regine Jean-Charles, and I am a second year doctoral candidate in Romance Languages. Mm. Um, my question relates to color, which did not come up at all during this. Um, and I'm wondering how, I just want to know your thoughts in the context of the lack of diversity for images of black women, um, especially when you think about the fact that, in an American context at least, what becomes dark-skinned and the lack of images of dark-skinned women. And when a woman who is a little more than brown with natural hair, say like India Ari, um, comes out, yeah, can't get Grammy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, but when 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 these sort when when an image of that sort of woman comes out, everyone's like, oh, she's just trying to be like Lauren Hill, or oh, they're doing the same thing as Erica Badu. What do we need an Eric, another Erica Badu for? Whereas if it were a woman who was less brown than her, who didn't have natural hair, it wouldn't be a problem, you know, because there's so many of them. So I guess I just wanted you to address uh, yeah, that a little bit. Yeah, I'd like to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> when when I was a little girl. I had what blacks, blacks back there called the only bad hair in the family. And the people in the church would say, poor little Kerr, look at all that bad hair. But my mother, who was very fair, with good hair. In quotes. In quotes. Oh. In quotes. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm telling. With, it was bad and good hair back there. I don't care what you say. <laughs> That is what it was called, and it wasn't Ooh. in quotes. <laughs> I had the bad hair. My mother would always say, hair is just to protect the head, and Carrie does a much better job than mine. And this, this lady that always called me that, she had all of this crinkly hair down like that, and I can't tell you what my mother said about that, because I... Mm. But, but the thing that troubles me, if we're going to be divisive, because of color or hair, we are lost. My mother was a wonderful woman. She said, somebody was, oh, oh, she had a friend who was a dentist uh, wife who was very fair with the good hair, no quotes, the good hair. And she said, and my mother, when, when Ann Spencer, the poet, would come to visit, my mother would have Langston Hughes. We lived in Montclair, New Jersey, 28 miles from New York, and Du Bois and all of those over. Also, my mother, whose mother was a slave and a maid, had the domestic workers that were dear friends of hers, too. So this lady of the diamonds and the fair and the hair said, why do you have to have those people here? Mm -hmm. My mother said, it's bad enough for white people to divide us. But when we do it ourselves, it's a sin. It just didn't make its way into the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she always had a response that was so quick. And I was thinking of something two weeks later. You know, I wish I had <laughs> said that. <laughs> but, <laughs> 
what happened, and, and the story that I wrote about my mother, it got sort of buried under the fact that she had a Confederate uh, uh, father. Mm. I can't tell you how, you might have a Confederate uh, great, great great grandfather, you know, we're, we're all mixed up like that. But the media, uh, Ob Miles O'Brien did that to me. He said, here is Carrie Allen McRae who wrote a story about her grandfather who's a Confederate general. I didn't write the story about him. In fact, when I learned that, that I had to put it down because I was just bashing him. And you can't write out of just anger. So I had to put that down. But the story is about my mother, who was a civil and a woman's rights activist from the age of 12 when she went up against segregation down there in Virginia mm -hmm. and took her little brown friend into an ice cream parlor with her. And of course, they were pushed out and, and whatnot. But that was her first, and she kept it up all through her life. Now, what was the point? I started all out. Well, yeah, we're going to have to. This has been a wonderful conversation. We're going to have to, unfortunately, take only one more question. Yeah. You're going to have the honor. All right, I hope this question blows everyone's mind since it's the last one of the night. <laughs> My name is Andre Byers. I'm a second year here at the Kennedy School. And I think a fundamental prin principle that we, we think is that like say in America, mainstream media, this isn't a phenomenon strictly for blacks, black women. I mean, when you think of Mexicans, you think they have tequila in their back pocket. You think Colombians, you think they have cocaines in their back pocket. You think Asians, you think they're in karate flicks. So I think the reason that we put so much emphasis on there is, and I haven't decided if it's subconscious or, or if it's reality, but it seems to me is that we feel as though our fates are tied to their policies, their opinions on us. So I would ask you, where are energies best spent? Is it trying to buffer ourselves from their policies and their opinions, or is it trying to remedy and fix our image so that we're not just viewed upon them negatively so they can just push us any way they please? Okay. Go first. <laughs> You're bursting. No, no but you know, I'm, I'm always like that, so really, if you want to go, okay. Yeah, um, I, I love think, it. I, I say both. Uh, I say part of the problem is that, that um, when you are, when you have been the oppressed for quite a long time, it's very hard to think, to get your mind out of that. And, and, and necessarily, I mean, practically speaking, we are under the thumb, to, to a large degree, of the images that have been made about us. We didn't have very much to do with how we were perceived when we first got here. That stuff continued, and now people are at different positions of power, and it continues as it does. And I think we have to take some responsibility if we're, if we are upset about it, you know, I mean, if we're upset about it, then let's direct some energy toward trying to amend that. At the same time and on the same front, um, you have to be doing something else that says that you're in control of your own image. Because if you don't, um, it, uh, you, you are, you're right, you're expending a lot of energy in a direction that at best is going to get some modification, but it is never going to be completely correct because it's not to the advantage of the people who are perpetuating the images mm -hmm. to make it correct. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not to their advantage. Right. Can I pipe in on this? Mm -hmm. Okay. No, um, two things. One, I want to connect these questions around color because, and these representations, because it's so important. For, representations do not stand separate from policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, public policy is driven <laughs> by public opinion and mm -hmm. perception. Mm -hmm. So in fact, when we do either one of these things, we are having an impact on the other. So it is absolutely, as you said, not only two separate projects that should go on together, but in fact, they're related to one another so that we can have the enormous increase in prisons, the cutbacks on welfare because of images of black people, even though there are many Mexican people on welfare and 80% of the people on welfare are white. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we can have a policy that actually disproportionately uh, in some ways affects working class whites worse, but it, it, it looks to their advantage because of the image of black. So what happens is that the imagery of black people has been used as a, a, a litmus test for all kinds of other people of color that we should be in representational dialogue with, because you're absolutely right. We have all these stereotypes, but blackness has been used really to keep many people under the thumb of those who have most of the power, which is a very small percentage of the people in the West. And color has been an enormous dividing point, even in these representations. 
organizations. And I think we don't talk enough about color, particularly for women, again, because, you know, when it comes to women, it's about what you look like right. more than what you have to say and what you do. And in a society based on color hierarchy, black women face more uh, abuse based on color and more separation based on color than any other group. And so I think it's important that we see how, again, the representation around color is keeping black women from each other because of the ways we, we don't treat each other properly. So there is an enormous politics in representation that I think needs to be coupled with policy in both cases. Thank you so much. I want to thank this um, panel. You were wonderful. Just really intriguing. And thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I want to thank the, um, I want to thank the audience. I want to thank you, the audience, and the questions that you, you raised. Um, there is an event afterwards. You want to say right, this? There's a reception on the fourth floor in the penthouse. Um, please come. All are welcome to meet with the panelists. Thank you. Oh, I'm all well, well, to hear so you. Oh, yeah. I think I'm, the top part fell off. <laughs> Okay, all right, okay.